the baby boom generation gave birth to the generation known as Generation X, or also at times called the Slacker Generation. Born between the years 1965 and 1979, this generation was unlike his parents' generation. While the baby boomers mostly grew up in a home with two parents, a dad that went off to work and a mother that would stay home, much like a 60s TV sitcom, the Generation X home life was totally different for many. The divorce rate going into the 70s was sky high, and due to single mothers and the rising cost of just getting by, most mothers, even ones that were married, found they either had to join the workforce or felt they were more than just a stay-at-home mother. This left a lot of the generation at home alone, at least for a few hours, those hours after school and before the workday ended. The kids home alone became known as the latchkey kids, a kid who was given a key to the house who found himself after school staying home alone or with his siblings until the parents arrived after work. This was, for a lot of kids, a scary time at first, but after the scary part of being home alone wore off, it became freedom. At school, they were supervised by teachers watching their every move. At home, parents were around to make sure they didn't get into trouble or do things they shouldn't. But those two or three hours before mom or dad came home, there was no teachers. There were no parents. This was a time to be independent. What did the Latchy kids do? Mostly sat in front of the television, eating bowls and bowls of Count Chocolate cereal, and watching mindless cartoon shows, old television programs that had gone off the air before they were even born, and watching strange live action TV shows that was somewhat of a mix between cartoon but with real actors. This is what helped give another term to Generation X, the pop culture generation. Their parents had grown up in a time of social change. We grew up in a time of Fat Albert giving us moral lessons. If there was a baby boom for pop culture, it had to be the 80s. Kids that grew up in the 70s watched reruns of Johnny Quest, Speed Racer, The Brady Bunch, were now finding themselves drawn into pop culture. We went from about four TV channels in the 70s to over 20 thanks to cable and would end the decade with hundreds of channels thanks to satellite TV. The latchkey kids that would come home after school alone were now turning teenagers and found they had a lot of time alone at home during the summer. During those school break summer days, you had at least 9 to 10 hours of freedom, but it felt like 24. Kids would wake up and easily find cartoons on TV during the day. Sadly, those cartoons would fade away quickly, and the TV shows on TV would be talk shows or news, causing the pop culture kids to turn off the television and do something a little strange, at least by today's standards. They would adventure outside. No phone, no GPS to show your location. Just you, your friends, and the great outdoors. If you were lucky, you had your bike, which meant now you had your freedom to go any place. You felt like Dennis Hopper, an easy rider. You were really only going a few miles from your home, but it felt like you were on the other side of the world. But you couldn't ride your bike all day. So a lot of your time would end up in the nearby woods, playing and building forts in the nearby woods, or spending all day in your friend's basement, playing out the latest galaxy fight or castle takeover. As you got older, that basement went from a play area to a hangout of exploring your mind and other bodies. But as we found a little bit more time at home, we discovered a new generation. One all about the music. When we were at home, our minds were being fed with mush, from primetime television sitcoms, TV dramas, to hours of Saturday morning cartoons, and then we got the call. I want my MTV! Sure, you had watched music videos on Friday night at 1 a.m., but now there was a music channel just for you, 24-7. The local radio DJ, that was somewhat of a local hero in town, was replaced with a VJ, a video jockey 
telling you about the new upcoming video or the latest video by some artist you had only heard but never seen before. Our minds were being eaten up with arcade ghosts, cartoon transforming robots, alien cat eaters, archaeologist treasure hunters, and now a Brooklyn Saint, zombie dancers, and dirty laundry. Thanks to MTV, you now had a soundtrack for your life. As you played, as you grew up, as you matured, in the background Sting was yelling for his MTV and the lyrics to Come On Eileen was being burned into your memory. Our parents were lucky if they had one big television in their home as a kid. One the family would sit around and watch for an hour or so. We grew up with a TV, smaller for sure, in our own bedroom. On the small tube but was more than just old television show, cartoons, and rich, greedy old businessmen. There were movies, and thanks to the rise of HBO, Cinemax, Showtime, and the movie channel, you had more movies for your eyes than any other generation before. If that wasn't enough, in the 80s, we also saw the rise of local video stores. So even if you missed it on HBO, don't worry, you could own it, or at least rent it, and watch Flash Gordon save the galaxy over and over again. Outside the home, the movies hitting the local theater seemed tailor-made for us. In the 70s, the movies were gritty, depressing, and often nothing a kid really wanted to sit and watch over and over again. The 80s, that all changed, and these movies seemed to be aimed to entertain us. We sat on the edge of our seats as Marty traveled back in time. We sat there in the dark theater in a panic when a marshmallow took over New York. But no movie spoke to us. No movie shaped our generation as much as the one that started a few years before the 80s, Star Wars. Most of us were dragged to the theaters in the late 70s, sure that we were about to see something that wasn't made for us or played down to us. Most of the movies before that were fun, and some were good, but they didn't transform us. They didn't make us feel like we were seeing anything special. That was until we saw the belly of a Star Destroyer come overhead. From that moment, for most of us, as silly as it sounds, it changed our lives forever. We were really seeing something we had never seen before, and it took us to a world we never even imagined. Coming out of the movie theater, whether you saw Star Wars in 1977 or one of the re-releases, it was like walking into a new world. Your life and the world had changed. Everywhere you looked, there were Star Wars. Toys, shirts, posters, rip-off television shows and movies. Our parents had the British Invasion, and we had the Star Wars Invasion. With the success of Star Wars, Hollywood did a shift almost overnight. Those gritty movies your father drug you to see were now replaced with summer action popcorn adventures. We watched robots from the future, muscle heroes from the past, kids face down their bullies, the dead made us laugh, and some movies made us afraid. We had grown up watching the movies and TV shows our parents loved in reruns at home, but now we felt we were watching something made for us, and we ate it up. Music, TV, movies, it might sound silly or trivial, but it really did shape our generation more than any other before or after. We had watched movies that made us scared to go to the beach, movies that made us want to go into space, movies that made us laugh so hard it hurt. Although there were fun, there was no movie that really seemed to speak to us, none that really seemed to get us, the Generation X teenagers of the 80s. Near the start of the 80s, we may have gotten the first film that really seemed to understand teenagers from the time period with Fast Times at Ridgemont High a film written by Cameron Crowe based on his take on going into a high school undercover. The film was able to capture the high school students in the Generation X era the way they talked and acted more than any other film before. But it would also shine a light and show the older generation that the new generation were slackers. What is a slacker? In short, it's a person that loves to slack off. A person that avoids work and effort. Were we the generation of slackers? In a way, sure, a lot of us found the 9 to 5 day life of office work like our parents had was not for us. We wanted something different. What the adults saw as slacking, we saw as living. But there was no one person to speak for our generation as great as film writer and director John Hughes. John was able to capture the feel, the laugh, the style of the 80s Generation X teenager better than any before or after. His first directed film, Sixteen Candles, 
captured the hardship of a young girl as she turned 16. He told the story of two Generation X geeks who made their own sexy robot. He gave us an adventure of the king of all slackers taking a day off from school, and probably his film that captured the spirit of the 80s teen more than any other was about five kids who were having detention on a Saturday. There was the school jock, the princess, the nerd, the basket case, and the loser. Stereotypes of high school students for sure, but we knew each one of these from our school, or maybe we saw ourselves in some of them. But there was still something missing in the movies and the music for Generation X. Sure, some of the music spoke to us and some of the movies got us just right, but it was being written and sung by people from a generation before us, writing how they saw Generation X. To get our voice out there, we had to wait until we were a little older and enter a new decade, the 90s. The pop culture pop music and movies of the 80s will see a shift back to a more grittier time as the Generation X came of age and started to make their own pop culture. Kicking off the 90s was a film written and directed by Richard Linkletter, who may not have been born to fit into the term Generation X, but being born in 1960, he grew up around them and understand them. His 1990 film Slacker, made on a $23,000 budget, shows the story of burnout college students dealing with life. This wasn't a popcorn film. This wasn't a feel-good summer blockbuster, but it was a movie that felt like it addressed many issues the Generation X was facing, and it felt real. It's a Madonna pap smear. <laughs> Salsa shark. But it was probably the 1994 slacker film Clerks that really spoke to the pop culture side of Generation X. Its witty dialogue captured what most of us Generation Xers in the 90s were talking about. The pop culture we had grown up on and the troubles of our lives. Written and directed by Kevin Smith, the film was able to capture the feeling and dialogue that was around us at the time. The two slackers of the film, who don't really know yet where they're going in life, spoke to many of us. We found a lot of ourselves in Dante and Randall hanging out in their pointless job talking about movies and pop culture. Also released that same year was a film that really wasn't about slackers, but its dialogue and its gritty storyline sparked the independent movie boom of the 90s. And like Star Wars before it, it would start a chain of rip-off and wannabes. Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction was a movie that took us back to a more grittier time in a film set in the 90s. With gangsters and drug dealers, the film was able to break out of the Hollywood popcorn machine and change 90s cinema. Like slackers, like clerks, it was a dialogue of Generation X could relate to. Also, like in Clerks, we see characters of the film would waste their time talking about pop culture and trivial things such as the naming of a hamburger. After Pulp Fiction, every studio wanted to put a reference to old television shows or movies into the film. It was now hip to talk about Speed Racer, Star Wars. It was cool to talk about pop culture. What you mean walk the earth? You know, like Kane and Kung Fu. During the same time, a culture shift was not just happening in theaters, but in music. We had grown up with disco, come of age with 80s pop music, but we needed more for the 90s. Our films were getting grittier. They were starting to be made by us and reflected how we felt. Music needed to do the same. That came with the release of Nirvana's second album, Nevermind, released in 1991. Almost overnight, the hair metal bands your older brother listened to was over. Here was a band that was more gritty and had a more raw sound that was speaking to most of the Generation Xers. Its lead singer and songwriter, Kurt Cobain, was born pure Generation X at the end of the 1960s. He summed up and even played the part of a Generation X slacker. Soon the music market would flood with slacker rock, dubbed grunge. From Pearl Jam screaming about Jeremy, to Alanis Morissette telling us how ironic it was, to Alice in Chains singing about a man in a box, the grunge era spoke to Generation X. Nirvana became the Beatles for Generation X. Like with Star Wars and Pulp Fiction, the market got flooded with wannabe and ripoffs. The grunge music of the 90s would quickly die out. The independent movies of the 90s would lose its Hollywood support, and Generation X would grow up, go to work, and spoil a whole new generation of kids giving them a trophy for every time they moved and hovering over them like a helicopter. The baby boomers gave us Generation X, and Generation X gave us millennials. I guess every generation believes that the one they grew up with was the best, but to me, and to many of the Generation Xers, even with our faults, it was the best time to grow up. 
Maybe we didn't stand for something like our hippie parents. Or maybe we didn't go fight for injustice like the millennials. But we had fun. We grew up in a pop culture world that is now being copied and rebooted. Some say movies, television shows, cartoons, toys, the music. That stuff doesn't matter. But to many of us, it does matter. It made us who we are. Be it a lackey kid in the 70s, an 80s teenager, or a slacker in the 90s. We are... Junk man. Thank you, sir, for that unsolicited testimony. <laughs> <laughs>